so once again, welcome. Uh, I'm Anthony, Anthony Huan. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer uh, at the School of Arts and Social Sciences of Hong Kong Metropolitan University, uh, which is where you are right now. So welcome uh, on behalf of the university as well. Um, so we're really happy to have uh, an, a really good mix of us. Um, I think we have students and teachers from other universities, of course, our own students and, 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 and staff members. Uh, we also have some secondary school teachers and students. So uh, we hope we're having a good time. And I assume this will allow us to have uh, uh, an interesting and, and productive, uh, I shouldn't use the word productive, rewarding um, <laughs> discussion um, to us to us the second mm -hmm. half. Um, so I'll just quickly talk to you about what this forum is about, introduce you to a really beautiful lineup of guests, uh, and and um, we'll also, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know what we have next. So basically, uh, I am a semi-poet myself. I, 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 I write poems in English, I publish a few, but I'm really uh, not as uh, published, and I, I have to use established, I cannot think of another word. Cold. No, experienced. I'm not as experienced as those sitting next to me and the other two poets who are joining us uh, via Zoom. And by the way, they are, are now based uh, in the UK. So we have this, again, good mix of poets, and I um, curated uh, this uh, for, for good reasons, because I think they kind of show us different characteristics of what I think uh, Hong Kong poetry uh, might mean to us. And, and again, I'm not trying to be you know, overly uh, conceptual or theoretical, but it's not a term that we can easily define, Hong Kong poetry in quotation marks. Uh, and think about this example. What if there is a poet who's born here, but for the rest of her life, she's based somewhere else? She's still writing about Hong Kong, maybe, and maybe she's publishing in Hong Kong, but do we consider her a Hong Kong poet? And also, these days, living in the digital age, we are publishing our works again in the digital world, and people from all around the world can access it. And are we kind of publishing it in Hong Kong as well? So it, it's not easy to define what it means by Chinese poetry, Hong Kong poetry, British poetry, whatever it is. And I think for us today, we're kind of trying to broaden our horizons this is really open to our interpretation, and hopefully there will be some um, good takeaways from, from this uh, for all of you. Um, uh, one more thing to say, this forum is supported by uh, a grant from the university, uh, from, from the government, so uh, really grateful for that, so that I, I'm, I'm, uh, I have the opportunity to kind of put together this, this forum. Um, this is Hong Kong Arts and Poetry for Poets in Dialogue. Are you in the right room, number one? <laughs> because we have many events going on uh, on this canvas. And um, together, we're going to focus on how um, uh, poetry can be the medium for you know, exploring what Hong Kong means to us. And also, um, there is this specific focus. Um, as a researcher, I, I'm looking at how um, poetry or poets themselves, how they can, um, you know, engage with visual arts in, in many different ways. So they can be using digital technologies to put together words and images. They might be making art themselves. They may be working with, you know, artists to create these beautiful book covers. They might be working with art galleries as well. So it's many examples which I'm looking at in my research, um, but we'll have the chance to maybe talk about that. Okay, without further ado, let me really just briefly introduce our guests. Um, <laughs> I'll just stick to what I prepared. So we have uh, Nicholas Wrong uh, in front of us. Um, uh, I think many of you will know him already. Um, to be honest, Nick, you're the first poet who kind of who writes in English and you're based in based in Hong Kong, and you're kind of the first one that I know and kind of introduced me to this whole new world. So really, 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 really honored to have you here. So Nick Wong is a poet, translator, and visual artist from Hong Kong. He's the author of Kripas and Besage Me. Am I allowed to show a copy of that? Just, okay. So this is Kripas. This is Besage Me. These are my own copies, and um, I'm not passing them around, but 
If you have the chance to walk up to me, then I'm happy to show it to you. Uh, we also have in uh, next to me, Kalia Nogas. And um, my first book review is, <laughs> is based on Kalia's book. It's been a very, it's been a long time coming. And, um, and you know, these few years we've been, you know, really good friends. So I'm really, again, really grateful for, for everything. So Kalia is assistant professor of creative writing at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. She writes at the intersection of digital and documentary poetics with an emphasis on making connections across decolonization and demilitarization movements in the US and in the Pacific. Her poetry collections include a hybrid print interactive volume, The Ground I Stand On Is Not My, is not my Ground, Drunken Boat 2015, and on the other side, Blue Four Way 2011. Uh, her works are widely available on the internet, so I really encourage you to check them out. Just hi, call me Lucas. And Nick Moore, of course, you see all their works. Um, and we also have on Zoom, should I start with maybe Jenny? Uh, Jenny, can you see us and can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, um, Jennifer Wong is uh, also really experienced and she's been, uh, I think sh she's published three volumes of poetry um, and many of them have really good connections with, with what Hong Kong is about, the culture, cityscape, food culture, all of that. Uh, and really happy to have Jenny on board, uh, also a very good friend uh, of mine. So I'll just read aloud this. Um, Jennifer Wong was born and raised in Hong Kong and now lives in the UK. She has a creative writing PhD from Oxford Brookes University. Wong is the author of Wu Ga, Let Us Home. And this is how the book looks like. Uh, it's published by Nine Arches Press 2020, which was named the PBS Spring 2020 Wildcard Choice. Uh, her monograph, Identity, Home, and Writing Elsewhere in Contemporary Chinese Dias Diaspora Poetry, was published by Bloomsbury in 2023. Uh, both, are, both are really inspiring books. Uh, again, you can easily find them online. We also have Tim Tim. Tim Tim, are you enjoying your drink? <laughs> I'm nervous, don't call me out. It's <laughs> sipping tea, it's chamomile. It's, oh, it's chamomile, oh, that was, that's really calming. Um, Ping Ting, also a good friend of mine, and then uh, she, for this project I'm working on, she already gave a workshop at a different place, so uh, really, really grateful to her. Um, Tim Tim is uh, an emerging and aspiring poet, and I'm really, really jealous, jealous of her work, how, how quick and quick, and, and quick-witted and witty and all of that, um, and let me just read aloud her bio. Um, Tim Tim Chang is a poet, poet from Hong Kong, currently based between Edinburgh and London. She's the author of Tapping at Glass, published by Burke in 2023. And uh, her forthcoming collection is The Tattoo Collector, to be published by Nine Arches Press in this year, actually. She also edits, translates, and writes lyrics and hosts a Cantonese poetry podcast. Uh, which is called Ying Si Hat Yi, and that's the name of it, tongue in cheek, I think. Um, so um, there you go. This is our beautiful lineup. Should we also? All right. So I think I've told you what this forum is about, and um, you know a little bit about guests. Uh, for now, I'd like to invite um, uh, Professor Charles Kwong, who is the dean of the School of Social. Oh, sorry, the School of Arts and Social Sciences to say a few words and um, to welcome us uh, as well. Um, I just say a few words. Um, for Nick, Gloria, and also Jenny on online and Tim Tim. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I just want to say something because I know there are some secondary students, undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now, I am a layman in terms of poem. I know nothing about poem. And poetry, but I always open up my mind to different kind of art form. I I, I go to movies, museum, I watch animation, artwork, and every kind. But even after many years, I still a layman. But but that is not important. The important thing is that I can feel and sense 
what they also want to do. For any kind of art form, I believe it is not important whether it is a poem, it is an exhibit, it is a movie or not. It is not the most important. Most important whether you can feel the expression of the audience. Today we are so lucky we have four poets together. I think it is the first time at HPMU. Here I must thank Anthony. Anthony come here, have a lot of research project and also organize this very innovative events for our school. And even actually, I should say, for our community, because I can see other people coming in. Now, I think uh, in future, uh, before we start, I talked to Cordia and Lick. If we just organize one seminar, I don't think we can create any impact. But if we can make it a series of poetry and poem, and we can, from the perspective of the authors, we can, from the perspective of students or from all other people, I think this kind of series can be more impactful. So finally, no matter what I say, thank you so much for all of you. I would like to say, I want this one today, it is a starting point for this series. And in future, uh, I believe, Anthony, if you don't object, and you have no choice, actually. <laughs> actually, you have no choice. Uh, I, I hope all our friends can come again and all the audience can come again and share with us and make this event specific, not just to HKMU, but specific to Hong Kong and all the community parties. Thank you very much. We have you um, for here. another moment uh, sure. because we really want to thank our guests uh, as well. So we would like to, first of all, just um, give a kind of token oh. of thanks to, to our should, wonderful should, um, guests. Should I, should I present? To be honest, I haven't thought about the best position <laughs> for this really important occasion. Um, but we can... Yes. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have our... Yeah, professional photographers, <laughs> which is... Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we actually have like a group photo of us yeah. and then we yeah. together. Yeah. Uh, unless you don't want me the photo. You can or yeah, Nick, you're saying that you He prefers <laughs> doing it this way. Three, two, one, two. Three, two, one, cheers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, can I say just two points? Number one, team team and Jenny. You haven't received our souvenir, but I promise I will send it to you. <laughs> that is point number one. Number two, for a souvenir, it is a new souvenir because it is the 35th anniversary of this university. So I hope it is also one of the events that celebrates our anniversary. And there will be more events to come. So please support our events and activities. Thank you so much. Um, right, so um, I think uh, we can kind of, oh, really, uh, Tim Tim and Jenny, I'll, I'll make it up yeah, to you when, when I see you, because I do see you, you know, every now and then. So, um, right, so I think we can get started, and uh, maybe we can start with a bit of, let me see how we're doing with time. Yeah, I think we're good. So I think um, uh, just a few housekeeping things uh, because uh, some of you may need to leave uh, early. So just just to tell you, we have the two lifts out there. You can use them. 
Uh, we also have the fire escape room. It's just down the road. Uh, we also have the restrooms. So if you need to use them anytime, and just let us know if you have any questions. Uh, Don is helping us with the computer setup, and um, and we also oh Genesis. Yeah, we have somebody else outside. We also have Edwin and Andy who is who are enjoying themselves right there as well. So, uh, you know, I, I I need to thank them for you know helping us put, put together this event. Um, yeah, just just have all the pictures. Yeah, uh, while we are having the conversation, maybe it's it's best to kind of be patient and wait until we have the opportunity to raise questions. Uh, but we do, we do. So in the first half, we'll have um, each of the poets. Uh, read aloud one of their poems or two. Uh, they will, you know, share with us some of their thoughts um, uh, or talk about their creative practice in general. Uh, and after all of that, and in between, we actually have certain conversations between them. They will also kind of comment on, on each other's works and, and thoughts. Uh, and then in, in the last part of today, we'll have like a, a free-flowing discussion uh, among us. And we also, of course, welcome questions from the floor. Uh, so that's kind of the flow of, of the day. Uh, I don't think we need to um, uh, go on until seven. It's really, again, uh, having some kind of buffer time and mingling time. So, um, but that's more or less it. Oh, oh sorry, Don, we have one more thing to say. Uh, we'll be taking pictures during the event. Uh, we'll also be, uh, you can see, uh, uh, we're recording this, but uh, your face is basically not captured. It's only us. Um, but we'll also be taking some pictures. Uh, we'll have a consent form. Uh, which you can uh, fill in if you allow us to use the uh, pictures for publicity and research purposes. And we really, really, really hope you are able to do that. Um, we're not going to do anything disrespectful or <laughs> will make you, you know, put you in an embarrassing situation. So um, hopefully you can sign that. Uh, at the same time, we have this evaluation form. So um, you can fill it in during the event or after it is, is the QR code. Uh, every one of you, I think you should have this poetry, uh, we call this poetry handout, which is, uh, yeah, this is the one. So uh, all the poems we are reading today uh, are from this, so you can have a look at it at the same time. Uh, we also have on the final two pages some other readings. Uh, these are all works from uh, our, you know, our lineup of, of writers and and all of that. Um, the, the questionnaire QR code is... Uh, um, at the bottom of the final page, so you can use it anytime. Um, okay, so I think we can get started. Uh, we are beginning with uh, Nick. So, uh, Nick, anytime. Hi. Hello, guys. Uh, thank you for uh, coming. Um, so, um, my poem is called um, The Urge to Destroy is Also. Uh, you can take a look at the poem on the handout, and I think Anthony would have an image of the artwork we have in response to later on uh, the slide. Uh, uh, does anyone know who Banksy is? We all want to buy one of his work, I guess. So. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to read the poem, and then I'll talk about um, 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 something about the poem. Uh, I wrote a paragraph, so I just read aloud that paragraph. Afterwards. The urge to destroy is also a creative urge, says Banksy, quoting Picasso, quoting insanity, quoting a shudder's electric teeth, the measured biting, quoting the few inches of canvas it ate, quoting a presumably witless sundown, quoting the red balloon of high that can't risk dancing. Quoting a string, quoting a girl holding, quoting her hand, holding the string, with no idea how much net worth is holding, or how little the holding can translate into survival. Quoting rumors about a girl's parents, out of a life and a Victorian frame, Quoting, no, throating, the father's name, not there, the mother's, not there, her own, also not. Inside, a bulletproof glass box, a not-thereness, 
tumult with waiting of viewers who love to see love contained, to know its limits. So I'm going to read aloud the comment I wrote on the report, just to give you a bit of context, which is not included in the handout, so don't look for it. <laughs> uh, the urge to destroy is also, the poem title, was written after I visited Mokka in Taipei City in summer 2023, where Bang Seek's Love is in the Queen was on display. If we can show the actual link in this one. So at the Southern Peace London auction in 2018, right after Banksy's 2006 painting, Girl with Balloon or Soul, the painting unexpectedly and immediately self-destructed. The crowd and the art world were shocked for different reasons. The formativity of the work, the, the attempt of the work to revisit itself as a tax, and the artist's role after the completion of the artwork. And of course, the hammered price, as well as the insane destruction of the work, the price paid for. However, I wasn't interested in any of those. What intrigued me was the curation of Banksy's work in the museum in Taipei. The short curatorial statement started with a quote of Picasso, which somewhat overpowered Banksy, the artist's statement. The urge to destroy is also a creative urge. That's his quote, Picasso, the Banksy in the statement, or maybe the curator's book on behalf of Banksy for the painting. So I wasn't expecting someone as hype as Banksy would rely on the idea of borrowing to frame his reputation and also the critical discourse around the work. So in my poem, I try to reenact the borrowing someone or something holding something or someone else so on and so forth because people who borrow who keep borrowing continuously thank you thank you so much Nick. um and jenny would you have any thoughts about that yeah sure um I, yeah, it's just such an honor to be here and also to listen to this poem read out loud. And um, I think um, other than what um, Nicholas has mentioned or introduced, um, I mean, my own kind of ref uh, reflection on this poem is how, you know, innovative it is and, and how much it kind of means to us as artists, because it feels like, you know, everything, like uh, when you think about originality, like it's very much like your influence, like as an artist, you're influenced by everything else around you. And, and that, you know, the way you interact with the world and including all these uh, images from Bansky and others and how, you know, if you want to trace back to the origin of the art, it's like, it's really hard because it kind of conglomerates a lot of influences. And um, at the same time, I really like um, the fact that it negotiates this, relationship between the purity of the art and also um, the consumerism, the the way like how it's, um, you know, Bansky's art is often thought about in terms of how much it's worth and how much it's sold. And, um, and so I just really like the interconnectedness, like the girl and, you know, the girl and the mother and the father and all that, like how um, everyone is connected in this, um, world of creativity and um and i also love the sound of it and the form of it how you know this repetition of quote uh, quoting sort of makes us feel very curious about you know um the story because you can't really you have the whole story in a way but you also can only you know know so much of it through um another person um, and I love the title, I have to say, The Urge to Destroy is also, you know, and then it runs on. Um, so that's mainly my reflection. And then ending with to know its limits, like how, you know, um, that sort of idea of the limits of love, the limits of the art as a form, um, as a product, as a consumer product as well. 
Okay. Thanks so much, Jenny. And I just like to quickly say, this is some of next newest work. So this is like a taster session of what is forthcoming in this new body of work. So lucky you. Uh, so Jenny, would you want to continue with uh, what um, the, the poem that you prepared? Um, sorry. Um, can you can you say that again? I can't quite hear. Yeah, she couldn't hear that. Oh, right. Sorry. Uh, uh, Jenny, would you want to uh, you know, talk about the poem that you prepared? Oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So my poem is also in the handout, and um, I think I will read it out loud. <laughs> um, Suli. The cure for homesickness is to resist falling in love with the city. In my dream, you hold a green thermos filled with poor. Descend the dark staircase of an old building. Your tall colored chipao casts a long shadow, a story. Six o'clock and the narrow steps lit by the soon extinct kerosene lamps. I see you eating alone at the noodle store where I was. A tropical downpour fills the gutters. My thoughts shift from one cigarette to the next. The smoke curls up for lean. In hotel room 2046, this is what I'll write. Crumble up and rewrite. Kisas, kisas, kisas. Many years after our encounter in 1960s Hong Kong, I feel the need to empty my heart of secrets, whisper into the hollow of an old tree. Um, so uh, this is, uh, this was written a while ago now, <laughs> but, um, but I would like to kind of still, it's, it's great to have the chance to revisit it. And, um, I think I wrote it at the time when, um, I'm sure that all of you feel very quite familiar with Wong Kar Wai's movies and, um, uh, and, and, and I guess you must have watched In the Mood for Love as well, um. And I think I'm very obsessed with the way that, like, uh, the, all those uh, cinematography and and Wong Kar Wai's movies, how they, you know, uh, nourish the whole generation or generations actually, um, and how um, it just kind of the fact that he added a name to and used this uh, person continuously um, throughout uh, this movie and the next movie makes it very fascinating to me um, because it's like quite a fictional person, but then captured through all these uh, images that we find about time and memory and places. Um, so I just um, had a lot of fun trying to um, remember or rewatch um, this movie over and over again to make this uh, piece. And, and then I, particularly enjoy putting in things that I really care most in the movie, um, like the green thermos, for example, <laughs> which I thought even back then, I thought it was really uh, old fashioned, but then I can uh, try to imagine what, what it contained, um, which we can't see in the movie and um, as such as the, uh, the, the type of tea in it. And, um, and then I thought about also how that music combines with the film and uh, how um, you know, like the uh, uh, Chalma one um, sat there, what, what, what's he really writing? Um, so I think it's, to me, it's, a, it's an interesting exercise in writing prompt because um, I don't know the whole story even after watching the movie. Um, I think back then I, I was like just kind of gathering or trying to rethink the message of the story. Um, and I think it's through the, this poem writing exercise that I sort of um, kind of interpret the poem for myself. Um, so I really hope that you enjoy that. Wonderful. And uh, would you like me to say anything? <laughs> um, yeah, I think just, just to say to the audience, we also have another poem by Jenny. Uh, and of course, for Nick, there's another poem that you can read in your spare time. Uh, the other poem that we've chosen is also, I think, based on 
um, kind of the trilogy of the of the films uh, made by Wong Kar Wai. So um, um, before we say any more things, I think um, Jenny, have you have you finished talking about the film more or less, right? Yeah. Right. So I think we can move on to Paula to see. Um, yeah. Do you have any response to that? Is this on? It is okay. There's no on off button on this one. I watched Nick turn his on. Mine has no has no mechanism for the little worry. Um, I just want to say also, I'm so happy to be here. It's so nice to be in a room full of people who want to think about poems together and next to Nick and to Anthony. And of course, to Tim Tim and Jenny, I wish we could be proximate in body, but it's so nice to be in the same space as you think. Um, I, okay, so about this poem, I love this poem because this, this poem like is the movie for me. You know, I was like, should I even watch the movie in order to think about Jenny's poem? And I was like, I don't think that's necessary because she's plucked out. And you said these were maybe the scenes that that were most important to you or the details. And I, you know, I think about I think about watching uh Sun Zizen like walk down the stairs, the rain scene, the sound of the rain, the noodle stall, like all of all of the texture of the film is here. Uh and what's really beautiful to me about that is that, well, for one thing, these are all from Tony Lung's character's point of view, I think. It feels as though that's the first person here about her, right, thinking and observing. But also, I mean, it's a first person poem written by a poet from Hong Kong who lives away from Hong Kong, <laughs> which I, you know, I bring this to the poem. I know that that's who Jenny is, or so that's a fact about Jenny. And so I also just think about, you know, these lines, many years after our encounter in 1960s Hong Kong. I mean, this also for me is this is the, is the voice of the poet talking about her encounter with the film, right? This isn't, you cannot have an encounter with 1960s Hong Kong now. You can approach it. Some Cha Cha Tangs are still kind of in the 1960s, right? There are places you can go or you can watch this film and you can go back, which is kind of what the film was about is that desire to return. And this is the thing that I love about this poem because it feels very much like an allegory of desire for a city that's changing, for a city you could never have known or uh, the power and evocative scenes that you still can catch glimpses of, you know, there, there's their pockets in the city. Uh, so that is what I love about this poem. Uh, and also, you know, these last lines, I feel the need to empty my heart of secrets, whisper into the hollow of an old tree, which in the movie this comes up, but that's not what Tony Lang's character whispers into, right? I mean, that's the image there on the left, right? He's whispering into a hole in the side of a temple. Uh, and Angkor Wat. So that for me also, this is this is the poet, right? This is, this is how I read this. I'm like, ah, I still have the urge, the need to speak some kind of secret and to the wood of a hollow tree um, for my sake, like as the poet. And I feel very much as though Jenny has shared that um, with me, with the experience of the movie and this desire um, to be a field in Hong Kong and to remember Hong Kong. That's beautifully put together. Uh, um, so, um, Colin, would you want to move on to? Um, am I right about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can kind of move on to some um, some new kinds of poetry, I suppose. Um, we've got some. Uh, we've got Nick's poem based on this um, kind of self-destructing. Art piece, and then we have some Wong Kawai's films, and now we're moving on to something else. Let's pass the time back to Paul. Yeah, so that was in response to visual art, in response to cinema. This is, um, I'm not sure I would call the Fleet Arcade a work of art. I don't know. Has anybody in this room been there? A few people have been there. Are you familiar with the Fleet Arcade? You can't buy it on the bus or something. Uh, as this context explains, which I won't read or really spend much time on, uh, it's it's kind of a an artifact uh, from the late 20th century, uh, sort of American servicemen and servicemen, naval naval uh, sailors would come from other boats as well, uh, shipping boats, and, and in the U.S. it's military boats, of course. Uh, and they would, you know, disembark, and the Fleet Arcade was kind of a services mall with tailor shop and restaurants. There was McDonald's there for a long time. 
Uh, and I believe that I may have been there. Uh, I grew up on Okinawa on a military base, American military base in Okinawa. And my mother and I traveled to Hong Kong two times in like 1989 and then maybe 1993. Uh, and this is where my mother would have gone because this is where Americans went. Right? This is where she would have gone with me uh, to go to a tailor shop or something. So for me, this is it, it's it's kind of a powerful structure because it's a it's kind of an oddity. Uh, and now it's gone. <laughs> it's been replaced. It's, it's you know, uh, I'm actually not sure. Is it torn down? Does anybody know? Is the building gone yet? No, not yet, not yet, probably. So it's been several years since they actually closed it. And also, as this text says, there was a real feeling uh, as I was reading the news and as I, I had friends who, who read Chinese, also reading the Chinese news about it. Um, <clears throat> what was largely expressed was maybe not what I would have expected as a person who's from the U.S. living here. Uh, and writing about pro the problems caused by the U.S. military, <laughs> like all over, uh, people were very nostalgic uh, and had, uh, I think, very powerful connective feelings to this place, partly because it was something from an older Hong Kong, um, and because land reclamation is really complicated, people have very strong feelings about other uh, inst instances of land reclamation along Victoria Harbor as well. So that said, is it a work of art, this image? I don't know, but I was responding to the built environment. Um, I'm also very interested in the way photography can serve as a kind of evidence that has a very complex relationship with the evidence our memory provides, right? You can take a picture and you'll say, oh, now I have this. There's a sense of, that you've captured it, but you can go back and look at the picture later and it's not how you remember it. It might surprise you, or maybe you do feel, yes, it was like this, and then there's nostalgia because it's gone. Um, the reason I'm talking so much, <laughs> instead of reading the poem, is because the poem is, is, is kind of impossible to read because it's within uh, an immersive photograph of this place. So Dawn is very kindly going to go inside and move around. If you have a VR headset, like, um, there's, there's lots of different little cardboard ones or, or gaming ones. You can actually click on VR if you're uh, the website and you can, you know, look around inside. Uh, Dawn, would you, could you scroll around a little bit? Oh, it's refreshing. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so if you pause right there, um, I mean, for me, this, 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 this is a poem. It says, the clocks are gone that kept fleet time. You can see those, that, I think it says um, New York, San Diego, and Hong Kong there, but somebody had taken the clocks down already when I, when I was in. Um, makes me think of Auden, um, actually. So the clocks are gone, the kept fleet time, relics of the colony. The shops behind you are no more. And if you move, so you don't see my hair, but <laughs> if you move up a little bit, yeah. Even the sea can be replaced with sand. Paved land, no, water, no longer a waterfront, lies through these doors. So those doors used to be uh, out to the pier which it's not any longer, it's barred down and now it's full of sand, right, of reclamation. Those are tables from McDonald's. McDonald's was gone a long time ago. Uh, and then there's just this amazing lens flare in this photograph. You keep going all the way around. This is the last line of the poem for me as I, as I think of it. The past is now too bright to see. So if you're reading this poem on your own, you can read it however you want. I can't control that. I did try and manage to make line breaks and, and, and kind of couplets. Uh, but it's a very interesting form for me to work in because I'm really kind of collaborating with the space. I have to find some place where you can read the text. And also I want it to be, I want the poem and the photograph to be working together to make meaning. So uh, it's a bit of an odd memorial to the Fleet Arcade, uh, but I hope that it stands I hope, I hope that it stands as a memorial. I do I do mean this poem to be a kind of memorial. Uh, a complicated one, of course. It has colonial history, uh, but it means something more than than, than maybe a simple, a, a simple version of that. Right. I, I guess we are kind of all inspired by by all this um, you know, beautifully put together work. And, and I think, Holly, you kind of mentioned one thing that I never thought about, which is how you really need to find the, find the space where you can actually put in words. Uh, otherwise, we would not be able to, to see what's on there. Um, 
Um, yeah, I can I can share the other one. I just don't want to take up too much time. So like we should do one. Do we have time? I will. But it's okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll show, show the the second one. Um, this one is a collaboration with the Google Street View photo, which is the more conventional way you you run into immersive photography or real estate websites, right? Uh, but again, what's interesting to me about immersive photography and writing poems in there is that there's this. The sense that it really feels like you can be there is it's immersive, which is why real estate agents use it, right, to sell you an apartment. Uh, but of course it's not, it's a screen. <laughs> There's no there there, right? Uh, and again, it can only capture uh, an image in a moment of time. This particular piece, uh, um, I won't read the text, you can, you can read the text yourself, but this is a site uh, in Manshan, uh, which I go past every day, I live in St. Kong and I teach at CU. Uh, CUHK. So uh, I had gone there without knowing what it used to be. Uh, I did not know it was the largest uh, detention center for Vietnamese asylum seekers in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, there's a little beach there, there's a village still, and there's like a million luxury housing estates, uh, and also a golf range and like a barbecue place. You can just, you don't have to be rich to go there now, but you do have to be very rich to live there. So if you go to the poem, Maybe go to the poem and refresh it. Yeah, thank you. I'm also interested in, in photography as a means of time travel and specifically Google Street View as a means of time travel because I don't know if you guys would do this, but I, I have spent many hours canvassing different neighborhoods when there are, you can go all the way back to 2009 in Hong Kong maybe further in some, in some places. You can see where the buildings weren't, right? What used to be there. Um, this is the last standing building, or was in 2009, the last standing barracks house from Whitehead Detention Center. It was still there. Uh, and in this poem, I'm interested also in thinking about the photograph as a text. Like it seemed poorly. Google Photos was not very good back then. Like it's funky. Um, the photo is seen poorly, as is the pavement. These trees are volunteers instead of planted. You know, nothing there was meant, it was kind of like a, a wilderness in a way. Nothing here was meant to last and hasn't. Would you like to see? Touch me, then me, then me. And if you're in VR with goggles, there's a little black circle at the center of the screen, which can be quite hard to find in the photograph. I think Donna's finding it. It will always be at the very center of your screen, wherever you are. It's tricky. Yeah. I, Maybe it's white for us. If you get touch me right in the middle of the screen, that should work. But then of course it's the internet, so it might not. But there you go, yeah. So this is from 2015, which is the next photograph that Google Maps has. And this is, you know, the luxury housing states under construction. And if you spin a little bit to one side, or the other, you can just see, you know, it's obviously radically different. Like the, the little building was, you know, right there in that parking lot. Uh, and then if you go to Ben Me, this is 2017, I believe, more building. Uh, and if you don't need to span all the way up behind, it just looks like that, but finished. And then all the way to, I believe 2020 is the most recent one, which is the last one on there, Ben Me. So what's interesting to me about this is you can see uh, that what has become the only anchor so that you know where things are is the text. Like I line the pictures up so that the text is always in the same place. So that if you if you go to the go to the left, yeah, over there, right there is like where that little building was. Right to the left of these trees are going to your And that's the dormitory that's going to be for City View, which is probably almost done by now. So Again, the sense of time travel and the, the feeling of really being there, but you can't go there now. It looks different, right? Even if you stand there, um, it's quite different. This makes me think, actually, of um, one thing I meant to say about Jenny's poems, if we were going to talk about both of them. 2046, you know, it ends with a bullet train into the future and everything else is just a reflection. Um, photography is a means of stopping time. I guess poetry kind of is in a way, too, but it, it just feels very impossible to me, even writing this kind of work, really bring that out. We're hurtling forward. Well, this is really, really, really creative and, and you know, something that we've never seen before, I assume. Um, so 
um, Kolya, you're talking about kind of how we use poetry as a kind of, um, you know, historical uh, archiving and documentation, and, and we do see a lot in, in, in the poems that we've chosen for today. So um, let's just move on to Tim Tim and see what response she might have. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah, all good. Awesome. I don't know, I feel like if I speak too much, I would destroy the work themselves because what I love about the works are the fact that you get to experience the space at the same time as the words. And the words are so minimal in a poem compared to the dense texts that give you the historical background. And for me, I'm really grateful because I was born in Hong Kong in 1993 to a migrant family in from Fujian. So I didn't really learn a lot about Hong Kong's history um, at home or at school. Because um, usually my teachers would just tell me that, oh, uh, contemporary history is outsy. It's not really part of the syllabus. And because it won't be tested in exams, so we, sh we don't have to learn about that. So having poetry as an entrance point to all these histories that we should know, um, it's really great. Um, because I do think that um, a lot of us think that poetry is something that we should tackle. But for me, I think in poetry, sometimes it gives you the really direct, it gives you a really direct experience of what is no longer here or what is still here, but um, the look of it is completely changed. Um, all we need to do is to pay attention. And, uh, and I, um, going back to Collier's um, poems, um, I really enjoy um, looking at the first one because I always love the fact that you see Collier's hair uh, <laughs> um, is um, at the bottom when you scroll up and down. And when I first saw it, um, I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a wig or a really cute black dog on the floor. Um, <laughs> and then I also really like how next to the hair, you get to see, I assume now, that's Collier's hand. And the hand itself is a bit distorted because technology. And the fact that um, with the, um, in that image of the hand, which is like a lute, um, nude blur, you don't see the recording machine almost. And I was overthinking maybe, but I was thinking of how the machine that records everything cannot record itself. Um, and I thought that's a pretty cool metaphor for how we try to approach history. Sometimes the vehicle is present, sometimes it's not. And it's really fun to unpack all that. And I also really enjoy getting lost um, in Collier's Fee Owl poems as well. Because uh, when I walk into the space of a poem, no one is there to tell me where I should look. And you don't even see the poem in full. So all you can do is to make sense of um, what the lines mean to you in your own ways and you get to tell if you're a grammar nazi or not because some of us like to form sentences grammatically some of us don't uh, so yeah destabilizing the reading process um it's quite an interesting way for us to look at history as well and in the second poem um the white head um i was really struck uh by how the past is described as bright because usually I have a really normy mind. When I associate the past with a certain color, I will usually associate with something that's dusty, something that's with Instagram filter or one car wise filter. But here, the past is bright, like the sun is completely like white or whatever color that you associate brightness with. So I thought that's a very subtle way of subverting how we associate adjectives with some nouns. And I also really, really love um, the lines, um, would you like to see, touch me, the me, the me. I don't know who the me is. Is the me the poem, the button or the changing landscape? And for something that is so unknown, unsure, to beg somebody to touch them. It's almost like, hey, come to know me. I'm here for you. Um, and the fact that we kind of need to use our fingertips to activate um, the changing landscapes, for me, that's really powerful because I don't know, before poetry, I never remember that I actually had a body and home. 
and to be reminded of those things and to be reminded of the fact that home could mean so many different things across time and space and to different people. The home in our mind may not be the same as the person who's sitting next to you. And I thought that's just so fun. Um, it really opens up a lot of stories for me. Yeah. I'm done. I'm <laughs> sorry, I rambled on. No, 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 your response is a poem on its own. Uh, would you want to share your work as well? Uh, sure, um, I will share. Um, so this is called Winter Now. I believe that you will see the artwork that inspired it later. Um, Winter Now, one. It's always 6 a.m. they come at you, heavy with a new dawn done. Searchlight breaks into households to stand in for the unabashed sun. It's time to cherry pick Hong Kong, every ungodly overspill. The rest of us never wake up new and useless, always superstitious about the arrival of words to bring home who's gone, the acute quiet baked in our daily bread, our bite-sized offering. Two, sometimes we enter a room and forget why we are here. Blanked out a few seconds, we are sent messages down a corridor of contacts, not quite returning to the original room. I couldn't bring myself to dissuade you from the birth of a hero, nor could I bring myself to dispute some notion of life goes on. This is not the hour for costless nicety. This is the hour to make room for the honesty of palms tucking out of a sleepless blanket to breathe on a frozen face. Uh, I just realized that I changed a word in my poem. Um, I don't know why I did that. Um, uh, so I wrote this poem. Yeah, I, I wrote this. Yeah, we're in the same room. So I guess that's. Yeah, how <laughs> how I sat here instead of there. Um, I wrote this poem in twenty twenty, uh, before I decided to um pursue a creative writing masters in the UK. Uh, so it's quite special to be able to read this um pre industry work um in front of a bunch of poets who have helped me so much. Um, and yeah, it's really special. Um, uh, I'm addicted to information, so I think I spend maybe six hours a day online just to read news, to feel connected, because I don't know why, um, I've, yeah, I think knowledge could connect us and, I, yeah, and that connection could sometimes be a bit strange, so I guess I was expressing that frustration as well. And the second thing that I'm obsessed with um, are sculptures. Uh, so if can we see the photo of that sculpture? It's a bit. Yeah, so this is a sculpture by Domin Teams. Um, I really like the fact that it's made with wood, but it looks so soft. And if you search the artist's name on the internet, you will see a series of wooden sculptures that try to capture soft objects. So another art piece of artwork that I really liked would be from afar it looks like a normal pillow but if you look closely it's made of wood and you could kind of see hands trying to push out of the pillow like somebody's hiding the pillow um I guess for me the intersection between sculptures and poetry um is how we kind of play with textures and I don't know what kind of textures I've created here. And I also also kind of like the fact that um, the sculpture that you are seeing on screen now kind of looks like a penis. Uh, it could be my mind, uh, but I think it's really interesting how by just putting this image here with some fingers tucking out of some really thin layer of wood that could remind you of so many different things. And yeah, I'm really bad at explaining things. So yeah, 
this is the poem and this is a sculpture. Go check out the artists. Thanks so much, thank you. Um, so yeah, we, we do have a good range of, of um, work that's um, being responded to or how these poems are connected to. So uh, Nick, would you have any response to that? Yeah, I have a um, short paragraph for you guys, uh, or um, just want you to get things clear. So I decided to comment on this poem by Tim T because it opens with an interruption. And quote, it's always 6 a.m. They come at you, searchlight breaks into households to stand in for the unabashed sun, unquote. The reason for the 6 a.m. visit is unclear, but it doesn't matter. I like the idea of intervention and outsiders trespassing in private household space. And after I finished reading the first section, I went online to look for, you know, the image of the sculpture that Tim Tim uh, was trying to write after or about. I was surprised that it was a sculpture made of camphor wood. It felt smooth, but it wasn't a pleasant kind of smooth because the figure of a sculpture was obviously hiding the face with the hands extending from what we call a sleepless blanket. The body of the figure and the blanket merged as one. The figure was hiding from something. His elbows or knees beneath the blanket could be seen. The sculpture felt weighty and it was round and wanted to be grounded for security. It urged the viewers to feel the anxiety and the unsettling presence that is frozen in time and in action. The poem wants that, well, nor could I bring myself to dispute some notion of life goes on, and this is not the hour for causeless nicety. Unquote. I wonder, what's the cause for a life that goes on? The life of a figure in a sculpture does not go on, neither does the Neither does the death of the speaker or the collective we in the poem. Time is what we use to measure the progression of life. And we have to remind ourselves that only time goes on. It doesn't mean a life does. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, I think we are, we've moved on to, first of all, really, really thankful to all the readings. And I hope um, just now we, we've had a good variety of, of poems and, and, uh, and readings and responses as well, of course. So I, um, the following part of today will be this um, um, free discussion, Q&A combination of them. Um, um, and I think uh, to start off, um, because what I can, I believe all these poems that we've looked at and, and listened to today are kind of anchored in, in certain things. So even though in some of the poems, the subject matter can be, you know, it's not easy for us to grasp it um, at first glance, but all of them are anchored in something in the sense that Let's say Nick's poem, there is this Banksy's work, and of course there are the quotes uh, being used. Uh, Jenny's poem, of course, there's uh, Wang Kawai's films, and even Collier's works, they are really um, kind of physically anchored. You have this pivot and you have to kind of look at, even though you have the freedom to kind of, you know, read the poem your way, it is still kind of anchored in, in, in that central point and uh and of course for Tintin's work there is uh sculpture so um could I first kind of ask any of the guests um do you have any kind of comment on that and we can actually perhaps um uh quote and quote use uh oh well it's actually Banksy's uh term but Nick if you say in your first line what's the kind of creative urge um behind um these works that we've looked at today um uh, give us a bit more good thoughts. Would anyone want to start on this? Creative urge. The creative urge, or um, uh, you, you've kind of talked 
Oh, yes, sure. You kind of talked about that um, uh, already. It's, it's more about maybe the, the quote and the caption and all that. Um, but yeah, maybe creative arts in general. Yeah. Okay, uh, so to be honest, I, I don't care about Benzi's work. The background of the making, the history, anything. I wrote the poem that you read uh, on the first page only because of the rhythm that I got in my head after I saw the painting itself. I didn't really stay in the room for more than two minutes. Mm. Uh, uh, I went up for like 20 minutes. I put the session, minutes, I went in. So it was a nice room, and then, yes, this is the work. And then, okay, done. But then I had this idea, uh, this rhythm in my head. Uh, the urge to destroy is also a creative urge, sex, fantasy, promoting, promoting, promoting. I think I let it out because there's a rhythm in this. And, and we can really yeah. get this rhythm from, from the poem. Thank you. Just well, only because I keep saying the same thing. I mean, but also the sounds of that, because I really get that Shredder's sound. And of course, it's the, the use of the word quoting, quoting, quoting. I really get that. I like the key sound. The rhythm. Yeah, yeah, the key sound, the basically. Key sound. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, I, 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 I the creative approach is basically that. Uh, rather than, you know, giving you the context of the word, you know, justifying the narrative in the painting. I'm not that interested in that. But, uh, uh, but this is the creative approach of mine. Right. Yeah. Right. So maybe maybe we can smoothly uh kind of uh, re uh go back to Jenny's work because it's it's very different. We we kind of, and Jenny's and, and Tim Tim as well because um um both of them have subtitles. Both of them right from the beginning are telling us that this is a piece of work that's based on something else. So before we kind of read the poem itself, so to speak, we have a sense that this is inspired by, by something else. So could we kind of first talk a little bit about that? Because it really affects or shapes our reading experience. So Jenny and Tim Tim, any thoughts? Um, for me, I just want to honor the, um, the artist um, by putting uh, the artist's name and name of the artwork there because I did use the image and I I do struggle with how much I could translate from a piece of artwork by describing it and my stealing ideas from the artist because I do think artists are poets without words um in so many ways. Um so yeah for me that's hermetic. I don't want to plagiarize anyone. But, yeah. Jenny? Um, yes, I think, um, yeah, I, I, I was thinking that when I wrote this poem, other than just relying on the film or kind of re-experiencing the film as a way of helping to um, bring out what I wanted to write about, it's also to do with like playing with I because um, obviously in the movie, like it's Chama One and and um, in, in the movie is also talking about um, the first person, you know, from his perspective, how how he sees things. Um, but, you know, in the poem, it's the I is like, is it is it me or is it like someone else or is it just a completely fictional speaker? Um, so I thought that's quite interesting to, to play with as a writer and Suli Jen as well being very fictional, like um, or maybe. And um, part of it is not fictional because it's in the movie as well that you can watch. So I just really like the fact that we can contemplate a piece like that. Um, right. Um, I think in the case of Collier, it's, it's very different, obviously. It's not an um, existing uh, artwork or whatever being referred to. And um, you've mentioned how at least Fleet Arcade may be a kind of memorial. So. Maybe it's kind of a role of historian that you are playing in a certain sense. And of course, it's not historian in the strictest sense because uh, there is this personal eye and, and all of that. So um, are you consciously trying to play the role of a historian or custodian and kind of think about what we can do to preserve certain overlooked parts of Hong Kong history or... Um, 
what I'm really interested in is is what you know people typically call the archive, like documents, uh, not just photographs, but public documents. And I've done a lot of work, um, like erasure poetry, and thinking about other people's texts and how you can make them say other things than they meant to say, especially when they are very powerful. <laughs> And you feel you were not. How can you? How can you make them say something else? And so, I, I do have a historical impulse, but I, I'm very interested in the sorts of history that are not available. Uh, as Tim Tim was saying, you know, like we don't teach contemporary Hong Kong history because it's not on the exam, right? <laughs> this is like those histories that are not on the exam are very interesting to me. And when I find something that feels surprising and much more complex than I. I mean, everything is more complex than I think it is, right? Like, you approach something, you only see one facet of it. Uh, but when I when I learn more about it, something like the Fleet Arcade and, and what it meant to people, um, something about, like, Whitehead and what it might be to be a City U student living on that ground and having no idea, uh, I don't think City U is going to advertise. Right? <laughs> it's, it's not going to be the Whitehead detention center dormitory. Uh, there seems to me something that needs remediating there. Uh, it's a different impulse, I think, with Fleet Arcade. That one I just felt um, it was very meaningful to me to see other people's responses to it. And I wanted to hold on to that, uh, to document it, I guess, and have to add that to the archive. And following on that, uh, Dory, I'll, I'll give the chance to you to ask questions. I just want to ask the last one before I move on to that. Um, because I think for all these works that I'm looking at again and again, uh, I think the the role of a creator or artist is quite is quite um, there, quite explicit. How in all these works uh, we see the role of um, of an artist or writer, even in in Jenny's work, you're talking about that's what I'll write, crumble up and rewrite. So we have this sense of the writer or the artist um, is is not just um, you know, like a um, fictional persona, we we kind of immediately kind of associate what we see on the page with with uh, with the poets themselves. So, um, is it something that you intentionally kind of uh, try to do, or is it how you can also talk about other works of yours, um, the the voice of yours? Uh, and and the self that you that of course you uh, you are um, the the connections between them. Do you think about that a lot when you write? Because I think this is something that I can see in in these pieces of work. Uh, it's not only kind of um, a viewer of of something out there. It's also me as 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 an artist um, of, of different kind. Would anyone have any? Thing to say about this? I think Tim Tim, you're taking notes. <laughs> Could we start with you if you if you don't mind? Or you need more this time? This is when the teacher found out your trick. You're jotting notes to avoid eye contact. Um, <laughs> and then they catch you. I'm sorry, um, we all teachers here, right? <laughs> yeah, I think uh it's a really big topic, but uh, I do think people label what I write as identity poetry, and some people obviously do not like that, because um, um, they those people's arguments would be um, that could undermine the craft of your poetry because this message is louder than your voice. And when I see you telling me your life story, how can I criticize you? Um, um, that makes the critics look bad. Uh, but for me, I, I think I'm still at the stage where I'm just writing to figure things out. Uh, I know writers who are good at constructing things. Uh, I can't. I'm just writing my way out of the mess that is happening. Um, and I guess that's how the voice is trying to um, form itself. And I have this really strange habit of um, reciting my own poems when I'm nervous at night. Um, I would just recite them to myself again and again. So it's like first of all, that means you have very good memory. I can never remember my own poems. Can, can you yeah, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been trying to remember my own work because I was. I don't know. Recently, it came to me that what if one day, uh, I'm on a desert island. I'm locked up and I don't have any books with me, 
and what what can I do? So I've been trying to remember my own work and other people's work too. So Collier's work are really great. Um, that like those are displayed today. Like I can remember those. Nick Nick's work is gonna take me a while to remember, but today that that was cool because the quoting and throating and holding are creating a great rhythm. Yeah, and I don't know, and I think there is this presumption of identity uh, identity politics poetry as well. So. I've never any intention. I've never intentionally watched Wong Kar Wai's movies, and I think, yeah, um, and I think, yeah, I I don't know. I guess when I write things too, I try to break some presumption a little bit. Like for me, like I would, I don't know. I kind of avoid influences like Wong Kar Wai at this point, but I know I shouldn't be because that's stupid. Because how much can you avoid, um, your formative years so yeah uh, that's all you can really ask questions to each other as well um this is this is the the time <laughs> can, can i please respond to your of course question um, um so point of view i think um well my poem is clearly the point of view of the view of the community so uh, it's a typical point of view adopted uh, where the poet writes about or writes about or after an artwork, right? A crisis. How come we never bring up this term today? I because I sent an email to my student and say this term is likely, you know, mentioned by someone. There's a slide, but there is no time for that. But we will come back to that. Okay. okay. So um it is simple and common, but I find um Really addresses useful for my creative learning class, which is not obviously uh, offered every semester or year. Um, and when it happens, it's already in Sam 2, which coincides with our Basel and our Central. Then I'll usually ask students to go to an art exhibition and go see paintings, installations, sound work for two hours. Now, you know, it makes you look good, right? It's, 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 it's Instagrammable. And then think about ways to write about the artwork. And I think this is a very good training for them. I usually ask them to shift the perspective. I mean, depends on what paintings you see. I mean, if you have, I don't know how many of you are familiar with your Dongmo uh, paintings, local painters work, your uh, Dongmo. Um, uh, it's very everyday life Hong Kong. And you, of course, you can take the actions, you know. Viewers. But if you encounter an abstract painting, like Sai Wong Li, um, like that, or Tracy Evans, there's no narrative for you to tell. You have to find a perspective. You can imagine yourself as the red that you see on the painting, or from the frame of the painting. Shift the perspective. This is particularly important in creative writing. Uh, it opens up your imagination and mind. But yet we are all reading these poems as poetry readers. The nature of approaching the poem is entirely different. Because as a creative writer, you have to be creative instead of reflective. But as poetry readers, you may want to like get as close as all of us intent as much as possible if you ever is a truth. Okay. So I think you know a uh, uh, perspective issue. Um for me, I think it's more difficult. <laughs> The training students writing skills and write something different, you know, persona. And we have that in Jenny's poem as well, I think. Uh, by the way, Nick, we've just shown kind of the definition of yes. the term is on the right hand side. And first is all ephrasism, pronounce it the way you like. And um, in general, these days, critics, researchers, include myself, we see it as a literary description of or commentary on a visual work of art. So it can be a painting, it can be a sculpture, even a film or something like a digital image. Um, um, but in the past, the term, actually the use of that is traceable to ancient Greek days. So um, Homer, he would like describe this shield of Achilles, all the small details in this all these concentric circles really beautifully spread over this shield. And But these days, um, uh, we kind of just used the term to talk about just poems and how they use, uh, how they write about art, how they describe them. 
Anyway, um, do we have other? Oh, we have we we have lost Jenny and <laughs> because of showing the slides. Yeah, there we go. Um, um, Jenny and Collier, would you have anything else to to add to this, or we we can kind of um, you know see what the audience um, would like to ask us? So. Yeah, I think I think uh, do we have any questions from from the floor? Yeah. Hi, this isn't really related to the poem specifically mentioned on um, today. I noticed that most of the poetry collections this year were published in UK presses or generally foreign presses. So I was really wondering, um, in order to be a Hong Kong poet, is it really necessary to kind of have this connection to the UK or to be kind of involved in the literary world outside of Hong Kong? Um, I think that's the elephant in the room, isn't it? <laughs> um, this is also something, well, I shouldn't be, should I start or? We should start with those who are based in the UK or I don't know. <laughs> The okay, the boys in your court, Jenny and Tim Tim. <laughs> Would you have any comment on that? No, that's fine. Um, sorry, um, can you repeat the question? Just like, is it so? Is it basically like, do, do they need to um, participate in in the literary scene or, or literary scene in the UK? <laughs> I don't quite hear. No, I was just wondering because um, I remember during our poetry course, like we had to talk with um, Nine Arches Press. So I was just wondering with all these kind of UK based um, poetry presses and collections, I was just wondering if to be a Hong Kong poet, it's really necessary to have this kind of connection with the UK and that you're able to traverse yourself in these um, British literary circles and to have that kind of means of um, traveling to the UK um, and like citizenship, of course. So I was wondering really if to be like a successful Hong Kong poet or writer generally, um, if you don't speak Cantonese, that's necessary to have this kind of um, British connection. If that makes sense? Um, yeah, well, I guess it's, um, you know, I don't know. I'm sure Tim Tim and and the others will men, uh, you know, talk about it further. But um, just like from my own personal circumstance, I think it's more like an unplanned, just uh, you know, <laughs> event that I'm here. And um, and I think it's like you know, basically after finishing my studies, I I continue to be in the UK. And and I thought I'm go I I always thought that I'm going to come back to Hong Kong Hong Kong, but it's you know, it's a continuous. You know, like uh, once you decided to stay, you you wanted to, you know, um, build something. You wanted to, you know, uh, immerse yourself and learn more about, you know, poetry and art and other things. So, but I think it's not. There's nothing that is necessary for an artist to feel inspired or to engage or to write because the practice is very global nowadays, and I don't really feel that. You know they have to also they don't have to speak a certain language whatsoever you know um and uh although having multilingual capacity is always a very inspiring thing i think um and i i feel that like although being in the uk has influenced my work in certain ways but it doesn't you know i also feel equally actually even more inspired when i was in hong kong because i recently came back to hong kong for a while uh, to visit my family. And I think like uh, there is something about, you know, being in the city where I was born that I, I feel like tremendously energetic and ha happy and in a way, even in 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 certain ways anyway, but um, maybe it's the influence of people you know. Um, and I think the creativity for me, it's in the mind, but it's a reaction or interaction with the place uh, or places. So I, I don't know if I explain myself very well, but um, but I hope that the other speakers can, you know, shed light on this. Um, I think, um, well, at least in, wow, speaking of my own 
experience. I think it's a personal choice. I think it depends on what kind of audience you want to reach. Um, because, and there is another dimension to it, because again, this is, we're living in a digital world. It's not just about publishing certain things in the UK, it's kind of getting, publishing it online so that you get the biggest draw or audience. And, um, but speaking of um, affiliations or connections, it's, it's really a personal choice, isn't it? And um, yeah, I don't have anything else to say about that, I guess. <laughs> I, I would just like to say it's really a question of economics when you kind of pointed this out when you're talking about resources, but also there are very few publishers of poetry in English in Hong Kong. Uh, Singapore, which people often contrast in terms of like many things, Hong Kong and Singapore, but you know, they have a very thorough government support of the arts. They have their own interesting uh, problems with that, of course, but uh, it's just, it's it's very difficult, I think, to be a poet writing in English. If you want to reach an audience, you need a publisher, you need someone who's going to take care of with your book, who's going to submit it to contests, who's going to market it well, who's going to try and get it into bookstores. And there's not a lot of that in Hong Kong in the English language press. There are a few presses, uh, but the options are pretty limited. So I, I, I think many people want to be read, <laughs> seek international publishers. Uh, just one last point, you know, in this regard, I guess. Um, this is an anthology, and it's one you're in it as well, I think. Uh, this is called Where Else? An International Hong Kong Poetry Anthology. Um, it features the works of all the poets, you know, sitting in front of you. And um, it's published by Firth, which is uh, British Poetry Press. Um, again, it's really about... As, as, as Collier, you've said, uh, there's a money side to it as well. Um, maybe we don't have enough publishers who, or people indeed, who see enough potential or, you know, financial draw of our, of our work. So, um, yes, there's the personal choice. And second, there's this market as well. This, there, there is this um, production side of, or circulation side to, to this um, poetry thing, if I do put it this way. Should we move on to, to others, if they have any other questions? We do have, um, I think we can have two more questions, depending on how long these questions are. Um, maybe, um, maybe Ernest, or I think you're Ernest, right? Because I know the name. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, I know there were people's names. Yeah. Oh, hi, yes, uh, I'm Ernest. I'm just wondering uh, about this poem. I was wondering where uh, uh, the, the urge of, to destroy is also a creative urge, and how by quoting multi, multi layers of quoting is also kind of. Like when you relay a message, you can destroy the original message. I was thinking there's a sort of like the dynamic of continuing the creation and also the structure of the, the original meaning, and also with the kind of fragmentary sentence and the very continuous uh, flow of the poem and kind of the lack of uh, punctuation. I was wondering. I don't know where this is going to, but uh, I was wondering if you would like to comment on that. Thanks. It's I'm just very, very quiet because if I don't repeat the quote, I can't go on when I write. So I'm relying on the rhythm to keep me writing to finish the work. So whatever the repetition makes you feel is actually valid. So I think it's the reader's job. I don't want to impose like, oh, this is punctuation less and this is exactly what I see did in his life or his work. I don't have this intact. Honestly, uh, 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 I don't even care about whether it's fancy work or you know, which work see. It is that I saw. So for me, no, I see it from a creative point of view. Okay. 
Uh, I think we do see a good variety of forms, um, if, I, if we're to use the term, how it's really this discursive, um, you know, rhythmic kind of form that we have um, in Nick's work and then Jenny's work, we have different shapes and different, you know, number of lines. And of course, Polly's work is digitally driven and team teams, there's like two sections and again, really fragmentary and all of that. So hopefully you, you, you're you shown this, you know, infinite, infinite opportunities for, for you when, when it gets to um, writing a poem. Um, do we have a, do, do you want to ask another question? The lady in front of us. Uh, so my, my question is for Jennifer. Um, so uh, we didn't get to hear you talk about your second poem, but they're both about um, Wong Kar Wai's work and like, um, I can tell from reading them, or at least what I'm sensing, is that you seem to have a really like deep connection with his work. But um, I found it really interesting that you chose, instead of writing a poem from your perspective about how you feel about the movies, you chose to write from the perspective of like, it, from inside the movies almost. Like you chose to write about it from the characters. And like, that's almost an expression of like that's almost an even even deeper uh expression of that connection to those movies and i um guess i was just wondering about like your thought process behind that like what made you go for that approach as opposed to writing you know from your perspective mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question um i i've tried to be brief but i i yeah i i think like Often maybe this relates to creative urge as well, which now is in Nicholas' poem and <laughs> what, what Anthony has mentioned as well. I think for me, um, uh, being the audience of a film um, sometimes um, almost makes me feel like I want to walk into the film and um, be part of it. And I think maybe that's from the creative urge of, you know, like admiring a piece of uh, art and wanting to be part of it and how to do this is like, to turn yourself into, you know, like one of the characters and, and you know, explore what they feel. Um, and I think there's this like intimacy when you have, like when you really admire um, artwork in, in that way, like you can take part in it. And, um, and also because of the unknown, like I think art is like um, very subjective and, um, you know, even when we look at the, uh, um, um, the film everyone experiences it differently and um, and and I enjoy kind of the fragmentary uh, cinematography of that uh, of their approach in storytelling because they don't tell you everything do they and and there's a lot of and uh, the hidden uh, uh, what you call that like the underlying uh, subtext that is not told in the story um, and I think that's partly why I enjoy those movies a lot and, and that repetition of characters and, yeah. Thank you, Thank you so much, everyone. Um, would we have any other thoughts for the time being? Any urge to make any other <laughs> response? Uh, if not, I will just appropriate Tim Tim's, uh, some of the lines from Tim Tim's poem, if she doesn't mind, I guess she doesn't. So sometimes we enter a room and forget why we are here. So um, I hope we had a good time, um, you know, talking about poetry and Hong Kong and art and all of that. Um, but Don, would you show the, sl the last slide? Yeah, I think the last, oh yeah, the second last. Would you do it full screen? Yeah, so we have other works that you can look at in, uh, if you have time. And the last slide, Tom. Uh, we also would again express our deepest gratitude to um, the, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, uh, we, we've lost the guests. So can we maybe share screen and then we can see them at the same time. I don't want them to feel ignored. Yeah, sorry for the hate help. I think we're doing, yeah, we're doing fine. All right, so um, once again, thanks so much to Nick, uh, Kalia, and Jenny, and Tim Tim. Um, it's been a long day for them. I'm sure they have, you know, other things going on. And I think, Nick, you, you just finished a class, actually. That's impressive you're here. And <laughs> um, 
so others, I'm sure you, you, you had a long day as well. So thank you so much for, for being here.